Good evening. Good, good. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Tuesday, October 4th City Council meeting. We are streaming live, also um, uh, archiving the meeting, but we are streaming live on City of Madison YouTube channel. Uh, like uh, all other meetings, we'll rise, bow our heads, uh, recite the Lord's Prayer and Pledge of Allegiance, and we'll get into the meeting. Thank you. trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May we have a roll call, please? Good evening, Council. Uh, Tevinoff? Here. Krebs? Here. Lucy Dottillo? Here. Josh Schaefer? Josh Schaefer? Here. There we go. Chad? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, no. Here. Chatham? Here. Bartlett? Here. Dan Dottillo? Here. All right, Council, have you had, had an opportunity to review the minutes from the prior meeting? If so, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes from September 20th. I'll move to accept the minutes from September 20th. Second. Any discussion? I will abstain. I wasn't here. Okay. Note the abstention. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Aye. Thank you. Before we get into the to the meeting, I, I do want to express um, the city's condolences for the passing of State Representative Randy Fry's mother, as well as uh, Indiana U.S. Senator Todd Young's father. So, um, sorry for their losses, and uh, the city expresses the condolences to both of our uh, elected officials. Uh, now I'll turn it over to uh, resolutions or bills. So the first resolution that we have is resolution number 2022-42C, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, transferring certain funds. Whereas the Madison Redevelopment Commission previously provided matching grant funds to support the Wilson Avenue widening project, and whereas those funds are held in the Wilson Avenue grant match fund, and whereas the Wilson Avenue widening project has been postponed until the growth in the project area warrants the need for such project. The city now desires to return the grant matching funds provided to the Redevelopment Commission. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, that the following certain funds are transferred. And that is 150000 out of the Wilson Avenue State Grant Fund back to the TIF Fund 4445. The next uh, so that's a resolution, so we that's need to vote on that. If we can, if we need a motion to approve. I move to approve resolution 2022-42C. Uh, is there a second? A second. Is there any discussion? Any discussion from the council? Seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote. Dottillo, Dan? Yes. Bartlett? Yes. Chatham? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Lucy Dottillo? Yes. Krebs? Yes. And Tevinoff? Yes. Okay. The next one is ordinance number 2022-26, <coughs> an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, establishing the Oak Hill Park Donation Fund. Whereas the city of Madison wishes to re renovate and improve Oak Hill Park or Oak Hill Neighborhood Park, and whereas the city of Madison wishes to establish a fund to deposit funds and pay expenses relating to the Oak Hill Park improvements. Now, therefore, be it ordained by the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, as follows An account shall be established for the purpose of depositing monies for Oak Hill Neighborhood Park, and the monies will come from donations, fundraisers, sale of merchandise, sponsorships, appropriations, and from city accounts and from any other lawful source. 
The account shall be named the Oak Hill Neighborhood Park Fund. All funds contained in the account shall be expended only for the exclusive purposes of paying the improvements and maintenance for the Oak Hill Neighborhood Park. These expenses may include equipment, fencing, brick, stone, concrete, walls, columns, and walks, landscaping, landscaping structures, matching funds for grants, fundraising expenses, park maintenance, and other expenses related to the continuous improvement of the successful operation of the park. The express written and consent of the Board of Public Works shall be obtained prior to the expenditure of funds from the account. The account should be non-reverting and exists perpetually unless terminated by subsequent ordinance enacted by the Common Council. If the account is terminated by subsequent ordinance enacted by the Common Council, the remaining balance of the terminated account shall revert to the general budget of the Department of Public Parks. Then we have first reading on ordinance number 2022-27, an ordinance to the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, establishing ready grant non-reverting funds. Whereas the State Board of Accounts of their June 2020 Cities and Towns Bulletin has stated that a separate fund for each grant is required. Whereas the City of Madison has entered into a grant sub-award agreement for our Southern, or our Southern Indiana Regional Development Authority, and whereas the City of Madison wishes to establish funds to deposit monies and pay expenses related to the Gateway Park and Mulberry Street Arts Corridor Ready Grant Projects. Now, therefore, be it ordained by the Common Council of the City of Madison as follows. Accounts are established for the purposes of depositing monies for grant granting agency appropriations from the city accounts from any other lawful source for paying required obligations for the city of Madison on accepted grants. These accounts shall be named the Re Gateway Park Ready Grant Non-Reverting Fund and the Mulberry Street Arts Corridor Ready Grant Non-Reverting Fund, and all <coughs> funds contained in the accounts shall be expended only for the exclusive purposes of paying our expenses related to the grants. The accounts shall be non-reverting and exist perpetually unless terminated by subsequent ordinance enacted by the Common Council. If either account is terminated by subsequent ordinance enacted by the Common Council, the remaining balance of the terminated account shall revert to the general budget of the Common Council. The next one is ordinance number 2022-28, and that is an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, amending sections 151.04 of the Historic District Ordinance. Whereas the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, has determined that updates to the building classifications will assist with the Historic District Board review and implementation of the Historic Ordinance. Whereas the City of Madison has completed a reconnaissance and intensive survey of the district and Whereas the policy of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, to preserve the historic heritage of the City of Madison is outlined in Section 151.01 of the Historic Ordinance. And whereas the Common Council of the City of Madison is in agreement with the recommendations set forth by the City of Madison Historic Board of Review regarding the amendments and ratings of the buildings within the Historic District. Whereas the Historic District Board of Review has recommended the map and ratings of the local historic district be updated while allowing staff to update supporting information on survey forms which does not affect the ratings. Now therefore be it ordained by the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, that section 151.04 of the historic district ordinance is amended and shall read as follows. Within the historic district, all buildings and structures shall be classified and designated on the historic building map adopted and approved by the mayor and the common council and made a part of this ordinance shown as Appendix A. Such building and structure shall be divided into three classes, historic, historic or significant, and that is a property that is individually listed on the National Historic Registry of Historic Places or as a National Historic Landmark or that is excellent example of a particular architecture style or vernacular form and is historically or architecturally important to the character of Madison and the local historic district. Historic or contributing, a property that is constructed prior to 1940 that retains good architectural integrity and contributes to the historic and architectural character of the Madison historic, local historic district. Non-rated or non-contributing, a property constructed after 1940 or is one that has poor architectural integrity due to alterations and additions and does not contribute to the historic and architectural character of the Madison Local Historic District. A, the owner of a non-rated, non-contributing building or structure may ask the board to designate such building as historic if they can show the certain criteria. Historic Board of Review or designated staff may from time to time update the support, supporting information on survey forms without impacting the ratings or maps. Okay. And the next one I would ask 
if we could suspend the rules and forego reading of the 31-page ordinance. The title is Ordinance Number 2022-29, an ordinance of the City of Madison, Indiana, authorizing acquisition, constructions, and installation by the City of Madison, Indiana of certain improvements and extensions of the City's waterworks and issuance of the revenue bonds to provide funds for the payment thereof, the cost thereof, including the issuance of notes in anticipation of such bonds, and the collection of segregation and distribution of the revenues of such waterworks and other related matters. So I would ask for a motion to suspend the rules to forego reading it in its entirety. I will motion to suspend the rules. I second the motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right. That will move on to second reading at the next meeting. Council, are there any reports, recommendations, and other business from standing select study committees? Okay, now we'll move on. No reports to city officials tonight. We'll go to bills on third reading. We have two bills on third reading. It's ordinance number 2022-19, an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, amending section 151, Point three of the Historic District Ordinance. Roll call vote, please. Kavanaugh? <coughs> yes. Krebs? Yes. Lucy Dottillo? Yes. Josh Schaefer? Yes. Chatham? Yes. Bartlett? Yes. Dan Dottillo? Yes. Next ordinance on third reading is ordinance number 2022-20, an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, providing for the redistricting in compliance with Indiana Code 36-4-6-4. Chatham? Yes. Datillo? Dan? Yes. Bartlett? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Lucy Datillo? Yes. Krebs? Yes. And Tevinoff? Yes. Okay. Now we're on to ordinances or bills on second reading. And there's ordinance number 2022-21, an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, amending the local plan for expenditures of the rescue plan funds. And this is on second reading, so we will open it up for any questions or discussions on this ordinance. I'm happy to give an overview if council would like. Pretty, pretty self-explanatory. As you know, the city of Madison, along with essentially every unit of government uh, across the country, received an appropriation of American Rescue Plan Act funds. City of Madison received approximately $2.7 million. Uh, there are essentially two guiding documents relative to the use of those funds. Initially, it was the Treasury Department's interim final rule. Uh, but in January of this year, the final rule was actually a pass that was effective in April 2022 that set forth purposes and manners in which these ARP funds can be utilized. Um, we had appropriated the first tranche of money last summer, and then just, uh, I don't know, about a month or two ago, we received the second tranche of money, bringing our total to $2.7 million. And there are five or six categories here. Stormwater infrastructure, matching grant funds, speedy recovery of tourism, premium pay for essential workers, public sector revenue loss due to COVID, and City of Madison Parks improvements that we're recommending appropriating the funds uh, toward. And Council, I believe I, I provided each of you as well a breakdown of each of those category and where the funds have been expended to date, which totals uh, approximately $681,000 you know, leaving, leaving the balance to, um, uh, uh, to appropriate. And 50% uh, of the funds were uh, uh, recommending go to City of Madison Park improvements. 
22% would go to stormwater infrastructure and planning, 4% for matching grant funds for public safety, 4% uh, for speeding the recovery of tourism, 12% for 11% uh, for premium pay, and approximately 10% for public sector revenue loss due to COVID. Happy to answer any questions. And, uh, you know, the, we do have a appropriation uh, deadline. The, the money has to be obligated by the end of 2024 and spent in 2026. And coincidentally, I know as we'll, as we talked about earlier on first reading, creating ready grant funds, uh, those are the same source of funds that we're using here for uh, our local expenditures. Any questions on that? Sponsors, Carla. Okay. Hearing none, that will move on to third reading. The next one is ordinance number 2022-22. And this is an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of Madison, Indiana, amending sections 96.99, 98.06, 99.06, 153, section 155, and section 11.60 of the zoning and um, planning fees and structures. So I invite uh, Nicole Shell, Director of Planning and Preservation, to come up and answer any questions the council might have. Are there any questions on this? I have a question, just so much as general comments. Um, this is almost identical to what we saw what month or a couple months ago. Um, my objections to it remain the same. I think the increases are uh, too much, too high. Um, especially the introduction of an application fee for the Historic District Board of Review. Um, I think it's, it's best to encourage people to utilize that process and to want to go before the Historic Board to receive input rather than doing things on their own. Um, and adding a fee to this doesn't, just doesn't help the process. Um, so I would move to change the proposed fee for HDBR application fee from $25 to $0. Just to be clear, the application currently has a fee. It's $15 with a $2 per sign charge. Uh, that helps cover our legal costs for the legal ad in the paper. That's the ad, yeah, that's which we, we have here. I mean, you gotta pay to get a copy of the sign. It's a printed material, the ad fee there's a fee to have an ad placed, but the actual application fee itself, I mean, if, if we're talking about $17 for the way things are now or bumping it up you know, to uh, $42, so I think it's, it's just a sign of good faith to our community to want to get the public to engage with the Historic District Board of Review. I disagree. I, I think $17 won't stop anybody from um, participating in, in the whole historic guideline process. So, not trying to cut you off. No, we, we have a We've got a motion. motion. Oh, is, there, sorry. is there a second? Okay. Hearing, hearing no second, that motion dies for lack of a second. Any other questions or comments on this? Are there any questions or comments from the public on this ordinance? Hi, I'm Jan Vetrus, 701 East 2nd Street, and I live in the historic district, and I agree with my representative we are trying to encourage people to do the right thing, and by increasing fees, I'm not only upset about the increase from $17 to $42, but also the idea that we would charge $10 for staff review. Is it just the planning staff, or is every department in City Hall going to charge for staff review? I find that offensive as a taxpayer. I also don't think that it is appropriate to, um, as, as Patrick said, to charge people when we're trying to get them to do something that they are not comfortable with. 
people resist coming to the Historic Board of Review, and now if we pile on the fees, you'll see the fees for copies. I mean, it's just like printing money for City Hall, and I find that really offensive. So I would encourage you, like you did a few meetings ago when I believe I was watching City Council meeting and there was a motion to raise fees and you guys voted it down five to two. So I'm, I'm really disappointed it came back up. I'm also disappointed there wasn't more visibility of this. Um, I've asked for two weeks now to have a comparison between the fees for a current project under the current rates, that same project under the new rates, and I have gotten nothing. So please, if, if you want to bring it up again, do, but it's way too early to vote on it because we don't have the information as citizens. Who, who did you request that comparison from? Um, Mindy, Nicole, and Carla. Because your councilman should have been able to present it because it was given to us when this was first brought no, no, up. No, the comparison. That was presented to us when it was first brought up of what the fees look like now versus no, what they'll look not, like. I'm sorry, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking if you would take a project that had the current fees assigned to it, like a rehab project in the historic district, and how does that, what was charged for those fees, how would you compare that to that same project under the new fees? What would be the impact on the resident in the historic building, district? Building permit-wise, yes. you mean? Building permits have all gone up. There are now charges if you want to do $2,000 worth of uh, HVAC work. I mean, these are things that the public doesn't understand and frankly is unaware of. Like I said, the last time we heard about this, you voted it down five to two. So I would urge you to vote it down again. Thank you. I would just, I would just reiterate here is that we've greatly increased the staffing so that we can better serve the community, and there is no shortage of applications in the historic district, nor is there any shortage of PACE applications that's providing significant and robust uh, preservation across the community. And so, you know, I think that uh, investors, builders, homeowners, they're accustomed to paying an application fee. And if we're going to continue to provide the level of service that we're providing now with a full-time preservation planner, uh, uh, professional staff relative to code enforcement, building inspection, um, and uh, certified planners, we need to be able to um, operate the office and staff them. Staff them accordingly, and as you know, you know, only about two-thirds of our budget's being funded by, by taxes. The rest is fees all across the city enterprise. So uh, I think this is a prudent thing to do. It's a way a business would operate. And uh, the fees, the, the small amount, the minimum amount of fees that we're, off, uh, that we're suggesting here is not going to uh, slow down growth or applications, and it's going to allow us to continue to, to provide a, a good level of service. My name is Camille Fife, and I re reside at 608 Mulberry Street. And I do agree with Jan, particularly since for a number of years we've tried very, very hard to make this an easy process for someone. Make it easy to come before the board. Make it easy to help to find out what you need to know. I do think that particularly the application fee and the reading fee are a bit more than I would recommend. So I would at least add that to your, to your knowledge and uh, whatever it is that you decide. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? I do agree, Mr. Mayor, that we have a lot of people moving in from other places. Um, they're used to these kind of fees. But as we discussed yesterday in the Board of Works meeting, um, there are also a lot of people in this community that don't have the resources to maintain their property properly. We are trying to help them, um, and charging extra fees is not a way to help them. So folks like 
some of the property owners that were here at the Board of Works meeting really do need help to do the right thing. They want to live in their historic property. They're not developers. They're not people that are looking to flip. Um, and they're not wealthy people that are moving into our relatively cheap town. They are people that have been born, were born, they have raised in that house, they want to keep it up, and now to charge them all these fees to do the right thing, I just think it's wrong. Thank you. Nicole, I just have a question for you. Did you do a cost comparison across other communities when you came up with these fees? Yes. Yes, uh, uh, it was a comparison from a variety of different sources. What I could find online, which is not easy, I will tell you. Um, I believe they range from Greensburg to Shelbyville. I tried to stay in cities similar to our size, um, but there's a variety of other that I could have pulled from. Thank you. Sure, and I would like to address a couple of things that Jan uh, said. Uh, the staff review, um, the Historic District Board of Review is, as far as I know, the only a city board that has staff review applications instead of it going through the whole board. Uh, just this year, um, from January to August, staff has reviewed 49 of those applications that would have otherwise gone to the historic board, uh, which is why we had asked to add a staff fee, because that wasn't done in prior years. We just increased uh, staff reviews in 2020 to include a majority of what the board would have reviewed um, versus when I started in 16 there were only four application types that staff could review um, and as far as what Jan asked for Jan you asked me about it on Monday so I've only had one day to prepare um, anything for you which I just got done half an hour ago um, but a property owner remodeling a historic home, like a 900 square foot home. I just pulled one of our latest ones. A construction cost that they provided was 30,000. Our um, building inspector does not think that's an accurate representation, but their building permit was $78. Under the new fees, it would only be 140, just to give you an idea. And Nicole, uh, that's good comparison, but what percentage of the applications now, because we are talking about making this an easier process, which has been uh, a great focus of ours. So what percentage of Historic District Board of Review applications are now only staff review rather than taking them through the lengthy process? It's, with a, the it's almost 50 percent. Um, between January and August, Historic Boards reviewed 53 applications to the Historic Board staff of 49. Yeah. So it went from 78 to 140? Just for a general remodel, because uh, our current uh, building permit costs are based on estimated construction costs. We have no idea how to calculate uh, or show that those are accurate. So you could say you're building a house for 100000 and it could be a $300,000 house. We have no way to decipher that that's accurate, uh, which is why a lot of communities have moved to the square foot model. So in essence, though, it's almost doubling the fee as it currently stands. On, on certain ones, it depends, yeah. Um, others, it's not that much because they have more accurate representations of what the construction is going to be. When okay. was the last time these fees were looked at and adjusted? Uh, 2018, I believe. Okay. Now, I think it's worth noting, too, about there's almost 100 different services you're performing that has some form of application fee attached to it. It's a... There's a lot that runs through building uh, planning and preservation. I mean, it's enormous amount of work volume. Uh, that, that's really with a pretty stretched staff as it is. I've been forced to navigate this system, and I've found your office to be very helpful, receptive. Um, you know, I don't want to increase fees either, but I also know there's a cost of doing business, and I love that we have this office and we have dedicated good employees to do the work. I appreciate what Jan and Camille are saying. They're, they're, they've led the way, been doing this a long time. So I have a lot of respect what, for what both of you have to say. But I also think that the process is easy. And I think that our rates aren't keeping people 
from wanting to go through the process. I think there are some people that simply don't want to respect what we have going on. They don't understand the value of it. They don't understand what the historic district is. But people that do, even the people that lived here a long time, um, that these fees are not what's preventing them from getting their work done. So I disagree, but respectfully do. And I just want to note that I did respond to Jan. I just couldn't answer her question. And then she saw me last night at the Parks Department and kind of explained it, and it made sense. But I just didn't feel qualified to be able to provide that information to you. I didn't want it to appear that I just ignored you. And I know. But I wanted my colleagues to know I did respond with as much information as I could give you. Anything else? That will move on to third reading. Well, let's tee up um, the budget process. There are three ordinances here tonight that are on second reading. Notice of tax. Each of you have the notice of taxpayers regarding the 2023 budget, the fixing compensation of elected officials for 2023, and fixing salaries of appointed officers and employees. Um, I don't know, probably a month and a half or so ago, we spent a couple of days going through all of the department budgets in detail, and uh, the summary of that really is being distilled down into a process that we're trying to improve this year uh, with the engagement with Reedy Financial and also providing council more information than, than before with regards to you know, our operations, our capital investments that we're making, and, and certainly what the uh, impact is from a tax perspective. A lot of the information that comes through our budget process is, is compiled through the Department of Local, Local Government Finance. Uh, they tell us our levy growth quotient. They tell us what our estimated public safety uh, lit tax is going to be. They do a whole host of things with regard to estimates. But still, they're all estimates. Um, and the county assessor has a, a major role in this process, too, with regards to the assessment process and uh, reporting to DLGF what the assessed values are of real estate for which the property tax rates are, are actually going to be then compiled. So what we have to do is distill that information down and figure out how do we, you know, conservatively uh, operate city governments uh, knowing that approximately, you know, um, two-thirds of our uh, government operations are, are funded by taxes and the other other third is funded by other sources of revenue, which, which we're always seeking to, to enhance so that we can not only provide great service to the community, but take care of things, uh, capital expenditures in particular. A lot of planning has gone into, into that, working with Redevelopment Commission, working with public-private partnerships. Uh, we have over, over, well over $100 million of construction projects uh, that city sponsored right now that's going on across the community. So what you have is the notice to taxpayers. Uh, this is still moving around a little bit. Uh, it's going to be in the, you know, our budget's going to be in the, as, as Mindy will introduce um, um, Mickey and Matt from Reedy Financial here in just a minute to go through the process in more detail. But our goal here is to adopt the budget at the next uh, reading so that we can meet the deadlines that DLGF has, which, which would be early November for a final final input to Gateway and final adoption for 2023. We're still looking for uh, ways to be more sophisticated about cash management, uh, about how do we accomplish our capital investment goals and, and do it in a prudent way uh, a, that also makes a difference. And, and uh, so right now I'll, I'll turn it over, but you do have the, the budget estimates. You have the book from uh, a month and a half or so ago. Um, I'll introduce Minnie McGee and she can talk a little bit more about, about the budget process and then introduce uh, Matt and Mickey. If I can, let me go ahead and yep. just read this real quick and get it on the sure. table. Um, this is ordinance number 2022-23, an ordinance for appropriation and tax rates. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. So, um, you know, we went through in detail the book that we had at workshop. That's the place that we start. And um, working really closely, Clerk Treasurer Rampy and the mayor and myself have worked with Reedy Financial, who have been working with the clerk's office very closely, to work these numbers where they need to land and um, what, what is the appropriate way to do that. So 
I want to introduce, I know you all met Matt Trimnell at our budget workshop, and Mickey Bell has joined him today from Reedy. I just want them to explain to you this process and the way we're doing it, because it is very different. It feels very different than what you're used to um, if you've been on council before. Um, usually we have it closer to a final place at this point. So I want them to explain to you the approach that we're taking and why why we're doing that. So, uh, good evening. How are you guys? Um, one thing uh, I think did you hand out the budget book summary? Yeah. Yeah, summary? Just the summary. Okay. So in front of you, you have uh, what we refer to as our budget book summary. Um, we're going to look at that. Um, we're going to discuss a little bit of the process, why it's why it's different than maybe that. Uh, Form 3 that you, you have sitting in front of you. Um, there's the entire process. Um, one, as financial advisors, the, the planning and budgeting process, the year cycle that we go through with our clients. Um, you can almost segment budge, budget uh, to its own process within the process. Um, we have, we've kind of came to the game late this year. I think we um, were engaged in May. Um, so we've kind of worked from behind, and I know we're coming down to the wire, and you guys have to adopt the budget in two weeks. Um, and, I, and I can assure you that we will have an, a, a good budget to adopt by that adoption date. Um, essentially, these first two readings, and if, if you already know this, stop me. I just want to reiter reiterate uh, kind of the process and what, how we go through uh, the process with our clients. Um, I think you guys have already done a first reading. Um, this is your second reading. Your third reading is your adoption. Um, the reason that, uh, so there's a whole bunch of state forms that we go through and fill out. And uh, those forms have to be completed. There has to be an advertisement sent out 10 days prior to your first public hearing. So from there, that advertisement, those numbers at that point, once they're advertised, can no longer increase. They can only decrease. So it is very typical at the very start of the process for us to advertise high budget numbers. Um, that way we can ensure uh, we can receive our full budget. Um, but from there, we are weaning down those budget numbers, looking at revenues. Um, during that time period, we're also getting a lot of the state <coughs> estimates are, are becoming final, um, able to implement those into the plan. So, so there's a long, drawn-out process. And, and again, we've worked with Mayor and Mindy and Clerk Treasurer Department to um, get the city's data, um, typically use June 30, um, uh, reconciled ledgers to do that process. Um, this summary that you have in front of you, um, is backed by probably 15, 20 pages of, of data that has several tabs and, and lines of data feeding uh, historical, um, comparing 2021, um, what you've spent through June 30th this year, and then including uh, the form ones that have been submitted. So looking, um, this is how the uh, budget sits as it is today. Um, uh, from left to right, uh, we have the fund numbers and, and the fund descriptions, and we have it broken down by the, uh, the budget category. So personal services, supplies, um, other services, capital, and then other spending. And then the, the total column shows you the, the total uh, budgeted spending um, right now, and then versus the increase decrease to last year's budget. Um, the, the orange uh, highlighted columns on the right show you what we are projecting as revenues uh, for that fund. Um, any unused appropriation um, and what that percentage is, and then the total uh, deficit or surplus in that fund versus revenues. So I will say don't, don't be alarmed by all the, the red cells. It is very common to have a, a budget when we come into this that, it, that is higher. It, it, these are wish list items across the board. Um, it is important that you know, these revenue uh, estimates at this time we, we feel very comfortable with. Um, we, you know, we have the state's calculations, we have the growth quotient, the AVs are out, we know what lit's going to be. So all this stuff is feeding the plan, there's a, a lot of moving parts um, that are feeding this summary right here. But what I will tell you is that it, it's important to understand what those revenues are. They're going to err a little on the conservative side. Um, I think it's always good to be a little conservative. Um, but again, that right column is kind of a, our target of, of how we need to uh, shift some appropriation around. And, and what we have left to do. So typically that right column, unless it's a planned spin down, we would like to see a balanced or, or a little, little bit of a surplus. So um, this, is, this is how it stands today. Um, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy. I, I know there's a, a ton of information and this is just one sheet. And I apologize, it's so small. There's, we try to cram a lot of columns onto one page, so. 
any questions for the budget? This is more a question for uh, Joe. If we're being presented with this budget at a second reading, how can these numbers change without us making a motion to amend it at the second reading? There's no, in, in our uh, rules and procedures, I don't believe there's any way to amend anything at a third reading. Yeah, so your first and second reading is essentially just a reading. You're not actually adopting the budget until the third reading. So again, we, we will advertise that budget, and that's typically what's get, what gets read in the first and second reading. This, the budget book that we use is, is, is essentially the Bible for the process. Um, you know, we work with a county client that's submitting or adopting next week, and you know, they have 10 revisions to the budget book. What makes sense to go in and adjust those state forms each time we make the revisions? It's just as long as we understand that going into the reading, this is as high as the budget's going to be. Um, by the time the adoption comes, those numbers will be solid. Again, we came in late, and I think moving forward, uh, next year's budget should be a little more seamless. Um, but we'll, we'll have a little more anticipation of, you know, we're going to go into January 1, and we're probably going to have a good idea of what revenues will be in the ensuing year. So we're going to have a lot of this work done on the front end, where if you did want to adopt it earlier on, it is possible. I, 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 I understand that, but yeah. the, the fact remains this is an ordinance, and I don't believe our rules allow us to make changes after a second reading. Well, I think they can allow it, and I'm going to do some, do some research. It, this has been a different situation than, than I've been, been used to with regard to, to some of the stuff moving around. Um, so I'm going to look into that and see what the possibilities are there and see if there is, is a real issue. Um, you know, I think generally speaking, the, the ordinance is the body and not necessarily all of the numbers. Um, and so I'm going to look into that and make sure that that, that is accurate. Um, I think the positive thing is um, it, it actually can be um, <coughs> amended on third reading. It's got to be by unanimous vote um, to do so um, but I will certainly I'm gonna, I'm gonna look into that and make sure that that is the case um, in, in in see um, it, it is it's a little bit different than what we've what we've normally done but we're we've also been reliant on um, on on these folks as our advisors to to help us through the process so and I can and speaking to just the experience with other clients Typically, uh, first and second reading, there's not even a, an assigned ordinance number until it's actually adopted. It's it's just the reading of the of the, uh, yeah. of the ordinance. And I'll admit, I I had the same questions, concerns, and frustration. I'm like, but wait a second, we we already assigned an ordinance. We assigned an ordinance number to a notice to taxpayers, and then as we start talking about how this process is really supposed to evolve. This is an opportunity with you know hiring our financial advisors to get better, sophisticated, and more refined at the process as well as the information. But it is really confusing, and I think it's misleading the fact that we assigned an ordinance number to a notice to taxpayers when, in fact, as Matt was saying, you know the ordinance should be assigned to the budget we're going to adopt. Form three is a notice to taxpayers. Form four, there's all kinds of forms with DLGF. Form four is the actual ordinance. That, D, that comes straight off of the DLGF website after you populate it with the with the uh, budget and the levy that you're proposing to adopt. Uh, so it's really a bit misleading, to your point, I think it's misleading that we've assigned an ordinance number to a notice to taxpayers, then it's more really uh, should be followed through in the process that you've described now. Correct. But this is our only time to discuss this, correct? Well, I think this is the time to bring out your comments and questions leading up to this too, which is we talked about it at the workshop. We had the first reading. We've got the second reading. It's not going to be adopted for, and we still have two weeks to make changes. So one thing I will add is we did have a workshop. Um, it was a very tight time frame. We didn't have a ton of time to explain the full process. Um, typically, that, that council workshop would be earlier. That way, when we go into these these public hearings, you you already have an understanding of of, of where the budget sits. Again, I, and I hate to be a broken record, just 
the, the timing of us being introduced to this uh, process this year has kind of thrown a wrench into it. Um, but typically, we would have that, that uh, council workshop earlier, you know, maybe July. And that way, as this is evolving, you know, we're transparent with you guys and you have more firm numbers for these meetings. I, I, I don't understand how we're expected to have a discussion if we discuss and then things still change without consent of the council. I, I, it, I can't wrap my head around it. I, I don't understand why we're moving about it this way. I mean, it, it, it seems like it's inappropriate. It's not following procedure. And if, if the form three is not what should be listed as our ordinance, then should we pull this ordinance altogether? and actually have the proper form four with the budget numbers submitted to us as the as the ordinance to pass so yeah i provided the form four ordinance that's uh this is depending on what i mean what oh, the state specifically wants us to adopt if that's that's it correct, that's correct. The form four. we had the form but three. The, those numbers as they sit today are not ready to adopt they yeah. they still reflect the advertisement <laughs> but that ordinance is a form that's on the state's website that you would essentially adopt at that point yeah, but right. and we don't complete the form four on DLGF until the, you guys have actually adopted the budget. So it actually, so it does get populated. So during the form process, there is an advertised column and an adopted column. So that right now it still reflects the advertised budget that we that we advertised in that public yeah to the, in the form three advertisement. That's what it still reflects. I will say too, the uh, same county client that I said is adopting next week, we actually, in their second public hearing, went through line by line and, and made the adjustments and it was ready to adopt by, or will be ready to adopt uh, next Wednesday. That's their process. So it, it is very common to see it change um, between the first two public hearings. But I understand the confusion and, and kind of how it's been and, and again, it, Hopefully, moving forward, we can be more transparent. Um, it, it's been very uh, trying to play catch up this year. Because we have a special meeting already scheduled for next week, if we tabled this for a week, would that give <coughs> would that give you guys time to? get final numbers for us to actually have a discussion on them at a second reading and that would still be able to keep us on schedule yeah so uh, a lot of these these numbers are still provided by you guys you know we're, we're essentially uh, um, providing the guidance and then how we yeah. sit so as long as we can get those adjustments in sufficient time then yeah what do you Mindy and Bob what do you guys think about that councilman I think that's a good recommendation because this is this is different uh, we've been trying to adopt the new process too and it is confusing so I if you want to make a motion to table second reading to the special meeting that we're having next week on October the 12th I think that would be appropriate which would allow us time to give you the form four, uh, not just rely on an ordinance number assigned to the to the notice to taxpayers if that's what council wants to do I'd, I'd be willing to make that motion. However, anybody else has any other discussion before we got to that point? I'll second your motion. Uh, well, I, I was going to hold off on making the motion to see if anybody else had any comments, comments at this second reading before we postpone the second reading. <laughs> well, I, as you have pointed out, at this stage of the game, we don't know what our numbers are. So, yes, I, I would tend to agree with you that we need to have those firm numbers before we can have an adequate discussion. And then I would, I would move to table uh, ordinance 2022-23 until uh, the special meeting, <clears throat> table second reading of 2022-23 until the special meeting on October 12th. I'll second. Yes. 
seven all. Yes. Lucy Dottillo. Yes. Jo Josh Schaefer. Yes. Chatham. Yes. Bartlett. Yes. Dottillo. Yes. Um, does it make sense to table them all? All three? You guys just asked that. Should we table 24 and 25 as well? I think so. So if somebody could make them, well, I guess I don't have. First, right? Huh? Hey, we have to. Yeah, I'll go ahead and read them. Um, if you guys are okay, we'll just do it in a batch. Okay. The next two ordinances on second reading are ordinance number 2022 2024, or 2022 24, and ordinance number 22 25. And that is fixing compensation for of elected officials for 2023 and fixing salaries for appointed officers and employees for 2023. I'd move to uh, table second reading of ordinances 22-24 and 22-25 until the special meeting on October 12th. And I'll second that. Roll call quickly. Krebs? Yes. Tevinoff? Yes. Lucy Natillo? Yes. Josh Schaefer? Yes. Chatham? Yes. Bartlett? Yes. Dan Dottillo? Yes. Thank you, Council. Um, <clears throat> moving on, are there any public comments? Uh, ask the uh, anybody here in the audience to approach Council in the Mayor's office now. Seeing none, I want to make a couple of announcements. We will have a... Oh, oh I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Mike Greco, 1106 East Street. I just want to make a comment about the, uh, the historical board and the raising of the fees and the people that have been here, uh, born here, raised here. I think one of the biggest problems is uh, people don't understand the rules uh, and they, they go by rumor. You know, I heard so-and-so say so-and-so. Uh, most of what I've heard are misconceptions about the historical board. You know, things like they, they're going to tell you what color to paint the house. They're going to, all these rules and regulations that I've found to be unfounded. Uh, I don't think the historical board can do anything uh, more or less than what the federal guidelines are for historical places. I think a lot of these people feel that they've been in these houses all their lives and it's an old house. They've, raised there and they don't understand the value of it. Um, I just bought three sheets of Luan plywood last week to do some work on my house. It went from $9 to $28 a sheet. Everything is going up. And these fees, though you don't want to raise them, you know, uh, all the time, <coughs> I don't think they're really that high to get a quality uh, workmanship and to get these permits. I don't think the people also don't understand it. When you get a permit, that takes a whole lot of liability off of you and puts it on that permit and that inspector to where you know the work is done right. If you don't have a permit and if it's not done correctly and you have an issue, your insurance company is gonna walk away from it. Um, we wanna keep the fees as low as we can, I'm sure, but uh, if there was something that, you know, I don't know if you can do it on Facebook or Madison Gossip or, you know, and, and I'd even be willing to help to set some of these guidelines and let the public know, you know, what are the guidelines for windows or for woodwork or, you know, doing the different things in your home? Because um, like I said, I've heard all kinds of rumors and they've all been unfounded. I mean, I've gone before the board and they've done a quick review. I paid the fee, and, and it, was, it was a very easy process. I think people make it sound that it's a lot harder than what it is. Uh, and the historical board does a wonderful job. Um, you know, and input like Jan and everyone else is much appreciated, but I just think there's, there's not enough information that the public uh, knows about. And, and be quite truthful, I believe it's on them. They don't seek that. They rather listen to their next door neighbor, I mean, or you know, some something that they've heard versus finding it out. Uh, that's the only comment I wanted to make. 
Thank you, Mike. I, I want to mention too, just as we're talking about the whole fee thing, but just, just a matter of a few years ago, building and planning was a, uh, a, a, a secretary, uh, a building inspector, and a part-time <coughs> preservation officer. Um, and now we have staffed that up with very experienced, very well-educated professional staff for the service that we want to offer because we do want to promote historic preservation across our community. And it's a very complicated, arduous process that we're attempting to make easier. But there is a cost to that service and there's a cost to that professionalism that has to be added. And we have more volume than ever before. That's the thing because we've married that process up with a program that's more staff approval rather than historic board. We've uh, completely amplified how much money the city and the redevelopment commission is uh, supporting the PACE program to the, to the tune of three to four, easily three to four times the amount that the city had traditionally invested. And so as these costs are rising, we know that we need to provide uh, incentives and gap financing, but also even greater levels of support than ever before. And I think the results speak for themselves. Mike, thank you for your comments. May I make a comment? Sure. As some of you know, I, uh, my Camille Fife and 608 Mulberry. Uh, as some of you know, I work part-time at the library. And by the way, we have, as an interim, I, d I do think that the suggestion was wonderful to get something on the website that really talks about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. But we have all the preservation briefs at the library, so anybody can come and see them and copy them if they wish to. Uh, they're all there. It was a donation of the Cornerstone Society. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other public comments? I'll make a, uh, just a quick announcement. The groundbreaking for the park improvements at Oak Hill will be October the 11th. I don't know the exact time. Do you? Okay, uh, that we're de definitely looking for that. We've made a lot of progress in stormwater policy. City of Madison is part of a, um, a stormwater association that's bringing more resources than ever before. So we're, we're, we're happy about the progress there as well as the work we're doing with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Hannah wanted me to announce that uh, we will be having the City of Madison's Halloween celebration, which is on the Saturday before Halloween from 6 to 8 at Bicentennial. And as you've seen probably, our street department's been working very hard on decorating downtown for Halloween, and Keeley's been working hard on a lot of the uh, decorations. There is Soup Stew Chili Brew this weekend, which is a fantastic downtown festival. And uh, our next meeting will be next uh, Wednesday, October the 12th. We'll have a special meeting to talk about uh, the uh, Waterworks Bond Ordinance, as well as finishing the budget process. So those are only announcements I have. Council, do you all have anything? Mr. Mayor, when is actual Halloween in Madison? Is it on Halloween the 31st? It's on Halloween uh, in past, and, and a trick trading will be from 6 to 8, I believe. With that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Thanks, everybody. I'll move to adjourn. I second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Josh, thank you very much. Good luck out there in Utah. Hopefully we'll have some hot dogs. Um.